Hi, and welcome back to the Wormy stream. We're going to be doing a... <laughs> Great, the chatter's coming right away. <laughs> so I'm going to be doing Wormy development right now. I'm not going to play coding game right now. I can do that later in the evening. So I'm going waiting for the coding game stuff. I'll do that this evening. Right now, we're going to continue with uh, the Wormy's development using the Leaf language. And today, we're going to be adding some sprites to this. So right now, the game is using just... Just GL, just a bunch of triangles. <clears throat> I know nothing looks like triangles, but we have the one sprite. Oh, I failed really fast. I can't talk and play at the same time, apparently. Although it should be really simple. So what we're going to do is I'm going to move the wormy somewhere reasonable. We're going to make like the actual game field. We're going to create a sprite somewhere, create a green field, so it looks a little bit lighter. And then maybe put some fruit or something on these little boxes so they're not boxes. Last time we created the basic shaders with vector attributes, we made the worm look like he's going to grow. And today we're just going to make it a little bit prettier because I'm getting tired of seeing the wormies in the front middle of it. And you can never chase this thing. It's a bad idea. So that's what we'll do today. This shouldn't be too hard. Making some <laughs> Yes, we're making some pasta, Daza. Um, so we have the worm pasta. A little note about this first is I have a little problem with the Leaf compiler right now is that I forgot to fix it before I started live, and I'm actually using a bit of a workaround. These functions, oh, actually I have to set up my functions correctly, set up my windows correctly, sorry about that. Game renderer, and we're gonna change the mode to streaming mode just so everybody can see this. I'm getting so used to the streaming mode though now that everything looks small when I program normally. So these functions at the top here, you'll notice there's a to-do on them. These are causing an issue in Leaf, but it was only after I did the platform changes, so it's really weird that this is causing a problem. And they're causing a problem that they trigger a debug statement in the code that says something's wrong. So what I've done for today is I've disabled the debug statement, and apparently it works. So I gotta go back and fix that. It has nothing to do with this show, though. Um, if you're interested, the debug statement is somewhere. Where is it? Expression. This one right here. When I mark an expression resolved in the compiler, it checks that, hey, you know, is the expression actually resolved? And, well, apparently it's not. And that's weird because this is not a new statement. This has been here for years. And something just changed recently, and that code was even working before with that enabled. So for now, I've just disabled it. Let's hope we don't to run into any issues in the show. I don't think so because we're not going to be stressing it very much. And that's during a function definition. It's coming on these ones here. And the issue is probably it looks like GL float is somehow not defined at that point, which is really strange. All right, so let's move on with it. Let's create, let's create some background image first. Let's deal with the background image. And this is going to force us to deal with the main images at the same time. So I'm going to run over to Pixabay and grab something. Um, let's look for a garden of some kind. Garden, and we'll just look for anything that's an illustration. And a lot of these aren't really garden, I guess. We want something more like green. Although something like this would work. It's a little bit too flowery. <laughs> I wanted something a bit plain. Oh my, I pressed the wrong button. And some like this might actually be interesting. I want to see, is this one actually a... What if we work with this? Do a bit of graphics work on this and make it... I'm going to open this one up. Let's see if it's actually a vector image. Is it a vector image? It is. So we could actually play with that one a bit. We can simplify that a little bit. I'd like to check for something that's easier to work with first because I don't want to do it with it. They have it in brown as well. Or I can just take more of a green background and work with that first so we don't get distracted. And let's just look for that like a outdoor background texture. Maybe see if it comes up with anything. Oh, it does come up with stuff, which is interesting. So what, what should we use for the garden plot? This looks like something that's usable for the garden plot. This one here we could use usable. What color should the garden plot be? These ones are all nice. Um, we have green. I think the background should be fairly neutral. So let's let's try this one here. This looks like a reasonable garden plot type image. So let's just use this one. And I think we'll trim it off so we don't have the border. I'm undecided yet. 
But let's grab that. Well, I'm going to put this into the README. I like keeping track of where these things come from. These people should get credit in the end for this stuff. And I have a README. And we'll put it down here, resources. We haven't used any resources yet. I have the font, but I don't think I'll keep using that font. And so let's just, we don't need, can, can we load JPEGs yet? I think STL image should be able to load JPEG. This is our background, so it doesn't need to be too big, so we can just take the smallest one. I mean, you, we could say you want the biggest one for fidelity, but um, it's still a JPEG. It should be okay on the smallest one, right? Um, we'll see how it is. We have the link for that. We can bring it back later. And let's go to there, wherever it was. Slash source slash leaf algorithms. Still. So now I'm going to actually create an assets directory now, I think. Assets. I don't know why I call it capital A. It's from my other sh few shows, always have a problem. And we're going to call this, uh, let's just call it background for now, background JPG. Okay. Now we have to load it somehow. And I'm going to put this back away. Too many windows open. So the issue with loading is going to be that I don't really want to create a new a new shader for this. Let's go with the existing shader. So if we look at the existing, uh, what do we have? We have a text block shader and we have the boxy shader. And so the current game is using the boxy shader. And this doesn't use a texture, but the text block one does, which is interesting, right? Because the text block one is actually, because text is a graphic, this actually does the same thing. This text block shader is going to show a graphic on the screen. So we could, in theory, reuse it. But we're going to want all the games, all the graphics in the game to have a graphic. So let's just use the existing one first. And we're just going to combine them together then. Vertex, vertex makes no difference. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this, we're going to put the text coordinate in and out into the other shader. Oops, I'm on the vertex shader. So we're adding two new parameters. I'm going to stick this back up here. Text chord and text chord. <laughs> These are bad names, and I'm going to call it uh, vertex frag text chord and vertex text chord. I don't know. That's a symbol. We keep the name. It's very clear what we're doing. And this is vector two, and this is going to specify in which texture it is. And we have to copy it across. I asked some colleagues about this, and uh, apparently we do have to copy this off. Although I recall that there is a way to do this with just a varying before. The in and out is apparently the correct way. And whatever I did before, which I thought I didn't have to do this, should not have worked. So it's kind of interesting that just know that this is the correct way. So we copy the vertex chords across. And then in the fragment shader, we're also going to have them in vec2 frag text core. But like in the other one, the fragment shader, we have a sampler here as well. Uniform sampler to text and text core. And whoops, put that in the wrong place. Go away. Boxes frag. That's where it is. Down here, we have a sampler. And that's a texture 2D. And we're going to have to load that in here. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep the normalized stuff here. We'll play with this later, but we just need to load it first of all. And we'll say vec4 t. Let's just call it t equals sample. And what did I actually call that? I always forget the actual sampler. Sampler, sample, text block frag, texture. Texture is what it's called. Texture, text chord. Texture, text, and we're going to take frag text chord. Okay, and so we have this T, and let's just multiply it by here. And this actually makes sense. We might just multiply it, but we might actually switch this first of all. If we run the game right now, weird things are going to happen because we don't have a texture. And, oops, well, we got an error first of all. That's probably in the fragment shader. 
texture, texture effect. We can't actually tell on which one it is. Um, this top one, vertex, text chord, frag, text chord, vertex, vertex. That looks actually fine. Vector size mismatch for error method. Um, we're actually writing out whatever it gets, so 0, th 13. Not here, more than likely. You missed all the fun stuff, Daza. <laughs> um, so we have somewhere here. Aha, yeah, we have the x, y, z, and times t dot w. So if we run it now, our game's going to be copying. It's probably going to have nothing on it because we have no texture there. We just have nothing for the texture. And this applies to all the textures because we're using the one program. And so we're going to have to put a background on and then modify the front textures as well. So let's look at how we can do that. <laughs> Thanks, Daza. Uh, wonderful. Um, so we're going to load a graphic here somewhere. And where do I load graphics? Hey, I haven't loaded a graphic yet in this game, so this is going to be interesting. Where did I last load a graphic? Um, GL demo? GL demo main leaf. I loaded a graphic here somewhere, right here. GL texture from file. So let's load that one here. And we're going to save it somewhere over here. What was that thing? Um, text tree. We're going to figure out what text tree is. This is actually one of the issues with uh, inferred typing. <laughs> I don't know what text tree is, which means if I have to declare it here, and I'm pretty sure it's just a gluent, but let's figure out. No, it's probably an actual, probably an actual structure. And I think it was from GL. Maybe it was from SDL image. Yeah, it is. It's a GL texture. That was actually pretty obvious from the name of the file, because it's a DL texture dot from from file. So, so var. <laughs> Adaza, you're free to ask questions if you don't understand stuff. That's not a problem, yeah. So this is a GL texture, and so our background is going to be loading it from the thing. And here we have to be careful with this name. Is this is actually going to be wormy slash asset slash background on JPG, and because we don't have relative files or anything here, I don't have anything like current file or something like this, which I should probably do. But these games are probably going to, the files are probably going to come from an external resource at some point, anyways. And so I'm still loading it. Um, <laughs> That's a lot of question sizes. So this is, um, since I put those graphics in place, this is a, if you recall way back when we did the coding game show, the Tron game with the little bots running around, this is based on this, and Wormy is the name I have from a very long time ago with the game. The reason I'm doing this is because this language here I'm using, Leaf, is my language, and this is working on the compiler. So what I'm trying to do is show off some of the language <clears throat> and force myself to use the language to fill in the holes in the language. And I found the most fun to do that on the stream is probably with the simple video game development because otherwise if I just jump into the deep internals of the compiler, it's going to interest like maybe one or two people in the entire world. Whereas with the game, at least there's something fun to watch. And I mean, as soon as the graphics come back. And so the end goal here is just keep filling in the parts of the the compiler that are broken, add the missing features, and fix everything we see, and get a little playable game out of this that looks good for streaming and stuff like that. I hope that answers everything. <laughs> okay, and so we need a few more positions in the shaders, and so we're using GL for this, and text chord position. We already have a TC position. Oh, I'm in the wrong one. This is a UI renderer. That's why I already have it. I'm supposed to be in the game field renderer. And so this thing up here should be should be there. <clears throat> so this one down here. And here we're also going to have a var text coordinate position gluent. And we also need a texture position gluent. 
Okay, okay, Daza. So, in Simba Farms, this is code. It makes a video game. The game is Wormies. That's our goal. <laughs> right now, I'm trying to put background graphics in. So we have this graphic here. <clears throat> we have this nice graphic, and I want to make this the background to the game. And so I'm, I'm integrating this into the OpenGL shaders right now. And these shaders, I can go through them again. When I open them up again, I'll show you what they look like. <laughs> so I need to just set this up. So right now, this bit here, it's loading the background. Seems for a GL texture from file, background. This part here, we're going to do TC position. I'm grabbing the location of the uh, vertex text coord. This is an attribute in GL. This is the one that's going to say where in the texture should I be drawing stuff. And so this is a position. And the same with this one here, the texture position, program.get uniform location. And I've forgotten what I've called that. Text. I just call it text. We're going to get the position of that from memory too. And <laughs> well, you know, that. DirectX only works on Windows, and OpenGL works, you know, on Linux and Mac and Windows. Um, I'm gonna go for OpenGL, especially since I don't have Wormies running on Windows yet. Um, they are similar systems. I mean, they, they both provide 3D. They work very differently. The Windows one would actually DirectX is gonna be a lot harder to get working in uh, in Leaf than GL is, because GL is like a pure sort of C library, which is easy to integrate. If DirectX is like any other Windows libraries, which I think it is. It's more of a C++ library, which complicates things a little bit more. It's still doable, but it would be a bit harder. And again, this eventually we'll get to such stuff in the show, but for now, I'm gonna stick with this. We're also using SDL here. SDL um, takes away some of the hard setup stuff. Okay, now, so I have a texture position and I have a texture. I have a background and a texture position. And how can I set this stuff up? Okay, we're gonna enable that again, enable vertex attribute. These graphics libraries, regardless of which one you're using, are actually relatively hard to use. Mostly you'd use a game engine wrapped around it, but we're of course writing the game engine. Nobody's offering a game engine written in Leaf yet, obviously. Okay, and so we need to create an array for this stuff too. You see a lot of duplication here, and this bit here, this duplication here, if you were writing a real game engine, You'd actually pack these all into one array rather than a bunch of four arrays because GL has a way where you can pack these all into one contiguous bit of memory and it's supposed to make it go a little bit faster. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, I said this earlier in the show, the amount of graphics we're trying to get out of our card is so minimal compared to what they're doing, we don't have to give a damn about how we do the GL stuff. If it works, it's going to be fast enough. Yeah, I think someone's dying in the other room. There's uh, children around and, you know, they're noisy. We'll just ignore the screaming, okay? <laughs> they're not people trapped in the closet, I promise. Okay. Um, where was I? After... <laughs> So pushing a box here, let's just push a box now. We're gonna do that vertex text chord. We're gonna do the same thing, the vertex, um, oh, we have to push four times as well, vertex. So what I'm doing now is I'm saying, well, which part of the vertex is it gonna be using? And since I don't have the proper one set up for the boxes yet, I'm just gonna push something here. And these are coordinates, gonna start at zero, zero and it's gonna cover all four corners. And we'll also have, always have to help all four corners. And that should be enough for that. And the same thing is gonna happen if I push a worm segment. Push box, push body segment. Oh wow, this is gonna be fun. Well, Daza, that's, that's not happened. But if you but if you want to see a GIMP, you know, this is GIMP. This is the open source editor GIMP. If you want to see GIMP, help GIMP. <laughs> There's your GIMP. Is that close enough? Um, you can have that one. <laughs> you 
the other gimps will have to wait. All right, so we're gonna, uh, this push body segment is what creates the bits of the worms. So we're gonna have to push stuff here as well. And now I'm trying to think of how I do that. <laughs> So vertex and all right, this is going to be a bit tricky here. Um, our worm's going to look crazy at first. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. And. I don't know if that's the right thing here. We need the same thing here. <laughs> Thanks. I like my improv stuff. I got to keep working on that hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to put these things here. Let uh, our var relative x equals clamp these two floats. Okay, these are floats. Bar relative y. All right, so I'm just trying. I gotta reuse some code here. I have to get this all working again because I destroyed the graphics before we can get back to them. It's so rel x rel y, and this will take a circular chunk of the graphic. And I hope zero comes zero is a reasonable one. Actually, this is zero point five. Perfect, perfect. And vertex, this is not vertex data, this is vertex text chord. And that should be okay. Now, vertex text chord dot clear. Create all of those. And now I need to find stuff somewhere. All right, what do I want to bind? Um, well, this might draw something. It's probably still black. Um, wait, I have an error. This has to be a GL float. We can do that, I think. No, we, we have to call a push statement. That would make sense. You gotta push something. You can't just add it there. Um, where's this one, 330? We use lossy because we GL float is lower precision than the actual float we're using for the calculation. Okay, so we still have nothing because I actually haven't loaded a graphic yet. And to load a graphic, how do I actually load the graphic? That's a good question. And GL texture here has a buffer thing, and we have to load the buffer into a uniform. So somewhere in here is a uniform. So we do another one, but set uniform. And what do they call the uniform? Forgotten now. Texture position. Texture position. And this is the background dot buffer. And let's hope I have that one set up. Uh ah uh, yeah, well. It's an optional, so we're going to unreference it first. That's something I have to fix, actually. Well, now you get blackness, which is not necessarily so good, but it's, you know, more than we had before. So this is like the advanced super expert version of the game. Can you play a black worm on a nearly black background? And that's obviously not what we want, so... We die, and then we go back. So we have to figure out what happened here. Why do we not have some sort of graphics? Let's modify the fragment shader first. Well, no, the fragment shader we know is working. <clears throat> this looks like our texture is blank, which is unfortunate. <laughs> Why would my texture be blank? Background. Background equals geolocation. This function did not return any errors. Now that doesn't mean the function worked because I wrote that function and it's written in a compiler that I wrote. So there's many things that could have gone wrong here. 
<clears throat> so let's take a look at that and see if there's something in here that could have gone wrong. We load a texture, we bind the texture, we load the image. Alright, so all this stuff, we check for errors in here and everything here works. So the question is, why did it not actually work? And now, it may have to do with this little bit here. We're using RGB, but it's, it's an RGB image because it's a JPEG. It has no, it has no alpha channel. But let's print out the size of this thing. Let's do standard print line. I just put it here. Image SDL text W my SDL text H. Let's figure out if it's actually loaded this thing correctly or not. And it has 640 by 520. So it actually has the image loaded. Hmm. Now starts the real debugging. So it's loaded the image. Since it's loaded the image, we're going to have to assume this rest of this stuff does something useful. Like it's actually. Yeah. Something super useful. <laughs> okay. Let's go to our game render and let's actually push the background directly on here now. Instead of push dot, we're going to do push. Actually, what do we? Push box. Do we use push box anymore? Push dot calls. Let's use push box. We'll say where we're going to. And push box, what is it doing? Um, I should have one that's slightly even lower level than this that says push rectangle. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a push rectangle. Push rect equals and positions the GL float to size the GL float to not a float when you do both of them and color is a GL float three for whatever reason and I think that's all I need all right so there's nothing else to do there and this one here is going to call push rect instead. I'm trying to reuse as much as I can. Push rect, and it takes. Now, push rect logically should not take the center. It should take the top left. Center dot x minus size dot x comma center dot y minus size dot y. The reason is because you'd want to have this fairly precise, and doing calculations down here is not necessarily good. Then we can simply call and we can pass size comma size here, and then we'll pass color down. So we'll just do center center size x size dot x size dot y minus and size dot y. Okay, we're going to push a big box now. Push rect. But we're going to have to do two programs, which is going to be weird, but we'll show how we can get rid of that later. I just want to get something working here first. If we do a push rect 0, 0, and the size is... Uh, I've forgotten what my size is. Uh, did I put relative to the whole game size? So this is relative to the size of the game. So what do I have? State dot... Let's look up the game. Game has a size. That seems reasonable. State.size. I'll probably just state.size that works. No, state.size.x, state.size.y. I might need to make this lossy. And this is going to have the color 1, 1, 1. So we just get the background of this. And it's probably going to complain center, yeah, 265. Well, this is supposed to be position. I should have changed that as well. It's no longer centered.
size. I called it size, I didn't call it SYZ, so. Unknown symbol. Well, that should be good. There we go. Put it down here. All right, doesn't like something there. 3C7. It's probably this one here. This has to be lossy. It's supposed to be a GL float, and an integer doesn't convert to a float without precision loss, so we have to specify it. And, ooh, what did I do there? Something else wrong. Type lacks fields. Yeah. Size doesn't have fields. Whoops. See, now we have a full black background. So we see the full image not working now as opposed to the bits of it. So now I have to figure out why. Why is the full image not working? Why do we get absolutely nothing for the background? Let's verify that we've actually save the image correctly. Go off to leaf here and not leaf lang source slash leaf algorithms. We're going to use the GIMP, so we're calling back the GIMP to load up our image and let's figure out why the background isn't loading. So we have a background here, it looks like a fine background to me. It loads the right size, it may not have the right colors. So why doesn't it work? Let's try a different graphic just to be sure first. Background. If we have a wrong image, it should crash on us. That's what we want. Well, not crash, but it should fail. See? Oh, it actually crashes, so that's actually bad. That <laughs> Okay. Wrong file name crashes. That was unintended. <laughs> but we know it has a file. So instead of this one, let's use tree.ls. Let's, where's our tree? Tree.jpg, because we knew this one worked from another show. All right, so I don't think it's the image loading that's failing, but what else do we have? We also have a eggplant. Everybody loves eggplant. All right, so I have something fundamentally wrong here now. Now I need to figure out what it is. And when you have a completely new framework, this is a real pain to figure out what it is. We're going to go back to the background we had. And we're going to change something. We're going to change the fragment or shader. This one right here. I wonder... If I get rid of this, it doesn't have an alpha channel. That's probably the reason why. It make it zero. No, it should be one by default. All right, so let's figure it out. What happened here? When you frag cut, let's take this out. We're going to switch to a debugging one. Fragment equals vec4. Frag color times light intensity times 0.1. I really want to make this go away, but if I if I completely get rid of it, it's going to optimize it out and give me a headache. And we'll just stick this in for the blue channel. So our red channel is going to be t dot x, and the blue channel is going to be t dot y, and we'll see what's in the other thing. See if there's anything in this image whatsoever. We'll just do frag color X, that's fine. Hmm. So that's a bit weird. So in, in, the, in the blue channel, let's put this instead. Let's put a frag text coord. Maybe that's something wrong with that. Frag text coord dot X. We know there's something there. Now, 
it's not blue enough, I would say. This should roll, run the full range from 0 to 1, because that's what we pushed into the thing. When we do the push rect here, let's go to push rect. Vertex norm, or vertex text chord, we've pushed 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is going to end up in the, this is the X channel, 0 to 1. And so putting it into the blue channel, frag cortex X, should mean it runs from 0 to 1. The fact that it doesn't, the fact that it's like always a very deep sort of blue indicates it's not coloring the full range of that. It's doing something weird. Because it should, it should be no problem to be that full blue. But it's not. So we, we're not properly loading this texture. Did I load it in the end? Vertex, hex core, bind, and push. Now what's in the Y channel then? Frag text core dot Y. Well, let's do X dot Y this way. The green channel appears to be there. Though I'm uncertain even of that. If we put zero here. It's a solid color. It's supposed to be a range again. That's weird. Um, so my issue is, is the frag text core is not getting the right values. It has nothing to do with the has nothing to do with the uniform, I think. It's a text chord itself. Why is the text chord failing? Well, let's focus just on that. Let's just do it directly. Let's do frag text chord dot x frag text chord dot y 0 comma 1. Then I'll get just that color. We can ignore everything else. And we're going to have to comment some things out, though. Because it's not going to find these anymore. It's not going to find probably... You'll find that still. won't find color and won't find norm. Get uniform. It probably doesn't find game size anymore. No, it doesn't find the texture anymore. So let's get rid of those things. Oh, right, but it's actually going to still find them. Yeah, it's still going to try to load them. So this is, this is an annoying thing. Because we're doing it, we're looking these up by name, which is actually not a very common way to do it in GL. Usually you just give them fixed positions and load them directly. And we can look at that later, but for now. So it means we just have to use the value somewhere. So we're going to say float junk equals... Frag norm dot x times 0 0.01. Make a nothing plus uh, frag color dot x times 0 0.01. So these will be virtually black. We won't see them, but it forces the GL compiler not to optimize them out. Okay, and apparently it still uses them. <laughs> text quote. Oh yeah, plus the actual texture itself. Plus t dot x times 0 0.01. Okay, so this should be a gradient. This is the issue now, is that what we're seeing here, this color, should be a gradient, because the texture coordinates have to vary over the whole screen. And so whatever is causing this not to work is the source of our problem. Because text coord, frag text coord, in text coord, and let's check at the vec, we have the vertex shader, and it just transfers those across. It copies the vertex text coord to the frag text coord. Good, that's all it should be doing. Now, what do we do in the game renderer? We load the vertex text coord in TC position. Perfect. 
Let's look for all the places that use TC position. TC position is a gluent. We also use it in the one that shows text. So it's a very similar pattern. We use it the one that sees text. So this is what we're going to see as well. We'd see if it's using something different. We enable the vertex attributes. Vertex attribute pointer. Um, ooh, we may have forgotten that. We did forget that. That's the bit we forgot. This little bit down here. We have to say what's in that thing. Vertex. What am I mean, calling this vertex text chord? Bind and push. And this is TC position. And there's only two of them. So that's the size. This stuff here is just telling telling GL what the format of that data is. All right, now we see the proper gradient. This is what we're expecting. We're expecting to see the proper gradient. And you can actually play the game with this just by the way it is now. All right, this is the fun part about GL and shaders. Anytime you do something debugging wise, you can actually play the game with it. Because as long as you can see stuff, but the stuff isn't quite in the right location, which is kind of annoying. Those boxes look to have something wrong with them though. They're not the right size. But let's go back and get the image there first. So we have this, now we can try and get the image loading. And this is because we messed up our shader, we, we messed with it here. What we really want is we want to get rid of this. We want to go back to the original one. times t dot w in case it's not, in this case it is transparent. Oh, we're back to black. How delightful. How delightful that is. <laughs> Let's not take that. Man, why are we back to black? Let's put a plus here. So we've got a gradient, which makes it look like something's wrong. But these things have the right color almost. Not the right size, but... Plus T dot X, Y, Z. That's the texture color, text frag coord. This we don't know, that we don't need that. So it could be loading the image incorrectly. Hmm. Hmm. GL is so much fun. Um, <laughs> it's this background. This is just coming from the lighting. But I need to load the... Where is the image? The image isn't loading. Now let's try one of those other graphics instead, just to make sure. Let's take the tree one instead, tree.jpg, because I knew that one worked from before. So it has nothing to do with that. What is the problem then? Why does it not like us? Created the background. Set texture buffer. All right, so this one and this other texture has to have a texture too. The UI render is using a texture as well. And it's using a text position. Text position, good. And text position gets uniform. Set uniform. Oh, I have to bind the graphic too. So many things to do. We have to say that uniform is a texture. And this should be here. GL is just weird, and they're actually setting to texture zero. GL is like the king of indirection. 
If you ever think that C and indirection is like confusing, then you know, you're not gonna like GL. Aha, so we seem to have a background tree there. Isn't that wonderful? And we have some weird rendering on the other stuff, which is what's expected. Okay, so what we're gonna do now first is fix the render again. The fragment shader to do times. And we can do times t.w here as well, and we're gonna switch back to the other graphic. We don't want a tree, we want the background. And you'll notice it's upside down right now, which is, we'll fix that later. Right, so it's upside down, but you can't tell. Now you'll notice that all of our characters in the game are taking stuff from that texture. And this is actually what texturing in graphics means. We're using a texture to draw stuff, and then we're modifying with the lights. We'll worry about giving those to a different texture later. So for now, we have that. So I think our texturing is actually working. Those little boxes aren't the right sizes. There's something funny about the boxes. Those boxes don't appear to have a full size. They used to. They're like just one quarter of them now, which is super weird. Super duper extra weird. <laughs> and we can do it this way by just doing a plus here instead. We should see that the full size now, unless I screwed up the size. Let's check. See, they're even the wrong size here. It's like the box, I think I screwed up the box when I, re, when I refactored that function, push rect, right here I took times half and that's the reason the boxes are half the size. So now the boxes are the full size. They're not in the right place. You notice they're slightly weird, they're slightly offset and that's also we had to fix because we refactored that. We can take off that here because it's actually at the top left corner. Oh, but we're upside down. <laughs> we're off by one, watch this. Watch, if I go right in the top of this thing, it's gonna eat it. And this is because we're inverted. Now I haven't really thought about what coordinate system I wanna use. This is getting really just, that's kind of a random change. The X is off too. Just really, really wacky now. Um, oh, because I put the minus here, so this might actually be wrong too. Oh, I did the minus, so we have just center. This should just this should be top left now. Um, just do top left and pass that. Ah, that's better. Okay, so we, we have the background graphic, which is less than exciting, but it's there. And but what I do is I want to move the wormies out of the way. Before I change the graphics to the other stuff, I want to see if we can shift this thing around the screen a little bit. So I can get the wormies text out and I can get the... Although honestly, upside down <laughs> with this little banner at the top is actually pretty good. The thing is though is that in this type of game, if you don't have graphics that allow it, should you be able to go at the top and come out the bottom? I'm going to guess that in this game we're not going to allow that because most players aren't going to want such a thing and it's going to be very hard for the graphics to get right because there's no visual affordance that you're allowed to do that. And the moment we put a graphic in it gets even worse so let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that feature and make him die when he hits the side. 
So if he ever hits the side, he goes blah, he dies. Just like he would die here. Let's fix that. We're gonna fix it, just change it. And that's somewhere in here. Move. We have this modulus here, right? We're gonna change the modulus. This does wrap around. This kills if hits edge. We're going to say head position dot x is less than zero, or head position dot x is greater than size dot x, or head position y is less than zero, or uh, wrong or or head position dot y is greater than or equal to size dot y greater than or equal to then what happens then then he's dead how do I say he dies then alive equals false I guess is all I do alive equals false return so that should make us die if we hit the edge let's find out dead now this weird flickering will get rid of, I'm not even concerned about that right now. <laughs> does he die when he hits the edge? Yes, he does. Perfect. He dies when he hits the edge. Great. We'll just assume the other cases work until we see they don't. Okay, it's dead. So, we're going to add Wormy's assets. Rudimentary background. Push this away. Now we have to, what did I say? I wanted to fix up the display. I want to put the wormy somewhere else. I want to put the title. And I want to make the game field to be inside, inside that area. Knowing we have this graphic, we kind of have it there. We can make them kind of go right to the edge. But I kind of prefer if he didn't. I kind of prefer if we were like just one from the side. But then again, we have to deal with the visual affordance. And I actually hit the edge there. So let's just say he does the whole thing except for the top. Let's cut off the top. You can't go to the top. And we're just going to make the top go completely white then. So the, And then we're going to push this whole graphic down. And that's somewhere in clear color. And we don't have a layout engine or anything. I'm really good at layout engines, but... We're going to take a long time before we get there. So it's going to be white. And then we're going to push that whole thing down a bit. Now the whole game is going to have to go down. So this is in the vertex shader. Vertex, game size. And we're going to do a... Try to think of how we actually do the pixel size here. We have to reserve the spot at the top for that. And we have to calculate some way that that can be done. I would prefer not to break up all the drawing into like a grid-like space. Hmm. This should just be game size, but we need to have an offset. We need to have like a window or something here. <clears throat> these vertex stuff here can deal with the window, but these are all in dimensions of game size. Which is perhaps a little weird. This is perhaps a little weird that the shader takes care of this, but it does make sense in a way that it deals with the game size. Um, let's deal with... Yeah, I'm not sure what I should do with that. Usually you'd have like a camera and a bunch of translation matrices and stuff, but we have something very, 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 very rudimentary right now. Um, but we could create a basic camera if we wanted to. So this is the world size then. And now we want to trade an offset. We want to multiply 
these whole things by a translation and scaling offset. I'm trying to think of how do we do that easily. I don't want to create more vectors and stuff. So let's just find a quick way to do it now. Um, huh. What's a quick way to do this without actually creating that stuff? We could maybe we just send it the matrix. Yeah, fine. Let's just send it a whole damn matrix down. Uniform. What are these called in Geo? Chronos. Where's Chronos? Geo reference pages. Uniform. GL uniform matrix. We're going to use a 4 by 4F. We're going to use a 4 by 4 matrix. And this will be fun because it takes a. There's so many versions of matrix 4FV. And transpose is. Oh, it's convenient, it has. We're going to figure out the right one. So what we do is by matrix, is this is going to be, and what is the matrix types in GLSL? I completely forgot that. Matrix type GLSL, is it like four, four by four or what is it called? Where are my matrix types? This is not helping me. Mat, mat, mat four, mat four I guess. Mat 4 GLSL. That must find something if we're concerned. Setting a Mat 4. Well, let's look at the reference first, see what we're supposed to be doing. We have a Mat 4. So, Mat 4, and this is the. Let's just call it the transform, okay? This is the transform. And the game renderer has to load this thing. transform position. And it's just an integer where we're loading it. This is also a uniform transform position equals program get uniform location transform. We're not going to set it for first and you'll see what happens is when we have a transform and what we do is a GL position is simply this transform times our vector or the vector times the transform. Oh man, this depends on what order we're doing the matrices. Let's just do this one first. Transform position. Where is trans for, oops, that was spelled wrong, wasn't it? Transform position. Okay. Now, this is all zero. This nothing shows up because the transform defaults as zero. So we actually have to create the transform now. And it's going to be a little bit messy because I don't have an easy way to do this right now. So what we're going to do is going to create an ugly type. I wonder if this is going to work. We're going to assume it works, GLMAT4. And this is an ABI pack. It needs to be the type that it would be. We're going to assume that the pack in here is going to be consistent with what we need. And this is for the location, count, transport, and float. And this has a bunch of values in it. And this has a bunch of GL float. And you can't pack multiple ones here, so it's going to be M11 GL float. One, two, three, four. Now you should use some kind of array for this, but I don't have an easy way to do this, and working with these things just kind of sucks. Okay, 
and then we do a four, 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 four. So this is a float, this is a, uh, this is a matrix. If you've not done the math before, this is a matrix. A matrix times a vector can scale and move something in a display. Let's just set up the identity matrix first. And let's create a function that creates that. We're just going to do define identity mat4 just returns a gl mat4. Takes no parameters. And so we're going to say var m is a gl mat4. And we're going to have to set all these values. m.11 equals 1 m.12 equals 0, m.13 equals 0, m.14 equals 0. Yeah, without some built-ins, without changing the way I represent this, without using like a fixed array, which I can't actually do yet in Leaf, just keep ignoring that, we have no choice but to do it like this. And we'll change all those ones as we get, and this is supposed to be 3, 3, why is this a And the identity is just where you have the diagonal to be all ones. And we return M. All right, so we're going to start with that. We're going to start with M equals whatever I call that identity mat. Identity mat four. And what do I want to do? What do I want to do? I want to, yeah, that should be enough. Then I'm going to bind this uniform here somewhere. Oh, wow, this is going to be hard. We have a whole new function here. And I'm going to simplify it and not do it directly in there. Where's that geo program? Geo program has all of these ones. But we're going to call it directly so I don't have to make this thing know about the type to make sure it doesn't know about the overload. Because this is kind of yucky. Import GL uniform matrix 4VF is a multi GL program. Why is this a, oh yeah, program uniform matrix, delightful. Program uniform matrix for you, yeah, it's just the same thing. It just has program in the front. Program uniform matrix 4FV. And this takes as always a location, a program location, a int. This should be a uint. And then it takes location, which is a blue int, a blue int. Don't know why it's a int, not a uint. Count the GL size. Transpose the GL boolean, which is kind of a weird one, but. Uh, and the value is a raw array of GL float. Value pointer. It's a pointer to a raw array. If you've not seen this before, arrays, even raw ones, are still value types in Leaf. A raw array can't exist as a value type, though, because it doesn't know the size, so it has to be a value pointer to it. And that's all that's saying there. Okay, so we're going to simplify this instead of calling GL program. And do down here, we're going to call it directly program.program. .program. And then this will be, what do we want to call this thing? Transform position. 
And what does it take still? It takes a location, which I just gave it. It gives a count. Why would it have a count? This is weird. Why does it have a count? It should know what size that is. Aha, uh -huh, the number of ones, so it's one matrix. Just we to get that correct. Transpose is zero. I think we have a GL false maybe, I don't know. We probably do for consistency. Not transposing it. And then we have Oh, because this isn't an array, I'm gonna have a hard time. Passing it an array now. Fun, fun, fun. What do I do? What do I do with this thing? Because I'm going to pass an array. Well, let's do it this way. Let's cheat a bit. We're importing it. We can import it this way. Instead of it taking a raw array value pointer, we can take a GL mat4 value pointer. It's pointed to a matrix and we hope it has that structure. And so then we can really just give it the, let's put transform here and give it a new name. If we've done this correctly, our game should come back to us. out of me somehow. I think maybe it doesn't find a GL mat 4. Now that's weird. Oh yeah, well this is M dot Dummy, 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 dummy. Cannot ignore value. 431. Where am I ignoring a value? Right. <laughs> Calling something stuck here. Um, I've forgotten why we did all this. All right. Yeah, the game comes back. Because we have a scaling factor, we have a basic one there. So now we can actually do different stuff here. We can do basically this one, transform equals, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do it simply here. I'm just gonna do it this way. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do full matrix multiplication. I'm just gonna kind of do scale here and scale mat four transform, let's say 0 0.5. And you'll see what happens here if we do a transform here. We really should do a full matrix multiplication, but that gets really annoying. So at this point, I'm just going to do it this way. I know, screw it. I'm just going to do it in line. You guys are going to have to follow until I have a library. So transform dot. And so for scaling, what I do is I'm going to say M11 equals 0 0.5 instead. And transform M22 equals 0 0.5. We don't have a three dimension, so it's not a big deal. This should scale the thing in a half. So our game's a little smaller. See, so our game takes up that little bit now instead. This is exactly what we wanted. Whee, so we have small wormies. Okay. Um, so we can do the full rotations and stuff now. We're not gonna do that. We don't want the full scale. We want the, the X scale to be the same. We wanna remain this as one. It's the Y scale that we have to adjust. And the Y scale, how much of the screen do we want to reserve for the header? And I want to make this completely responsive for now, which is actually pretty dumb. I should actually know the exact size of the screen and reserve like a certain number of pixels. But for now, let's just reserve 
5% of the screen, so it's going to be 0 0.95, but then we need to move it down as well because this is going to scale in the middle, but we want to actually move it down, and depending on whether this is transposed or not, this is either 2, 4, or 4, 2. I'm going to say 4, 2, and I'm going to move it down 0 0.05, probably 0 0.025. Let's see where it does this. Oh yeah, that moves it up because we're inverted again. <laughs> we should really figure out what our uh, view is here, what view we have. All right, so this is, we reserve the space at the top and we have to patch up this graphic later so that it fits there. But you know, maybe it's not so bad because it gives you a nice border and over here we don't have that border. So maybe we should do a different color up there for the border, some different background color, whatever we had before. That might actually make more sense in the main. Let's go back to the previous background color. We're also going to change where Wormy's renders now with the text, put it up in the top. And we did that in the text renderer here. Title score, title we drew right in the middle at 0, 0. And that's in normalized coordinates, which is really weird. So now it's going to be a minus 1, minus 1, and 0 0.05. And this is supposed to be the center of it, though. So it's going to center it right in the corner. Not what I want. There's something totally stupid there, actually. Right, we're not quite right there. It's because I'm, I've center aligned it, which is really weird. And I'm gonna make it a bit bigger than that. The Y is correct. All right, but I don't know the size of that text, I think. Right, that's the issue is what I've actually done here is <laughs> I'm centering there and my draw text doesn't have an option not to center there. It's always going to center there. And it actually does the calculation where to center it. For now, I'm just going to fiddle with it until we get the right ones. And I'm going to make it a bit bigger so it fits a bit better. And 8.5, does that look good enough? a little bit more there we go, we have wormies and we have that text there I'm already not liking the black so I'm going to change the color of it I'm going to go back to the gray, I like the gray on this side here actually to be honest so let's figure what that out and this is, you notice this thing's inverted and that's just an error in our system in our game and let's sample something from the screen. Let's sample a darker one here so it has a nice contrast. And now we have to convert this into floating points. And this is one of my pet peeves about a lot of uh, a lot of graphics programs is that they never give you normalized values. They give you the useless hex, but it, and they give you useless values in zero to 255. Like, like anybody actually wants that. It's, a, it's like a, a Dumb, a dumb convention that we got stuck with at some point, whereas the floating point normalized actually makes the most sense. 9771. So 9771. And this is divided by 255. Divided by 255. Divided by 255. Not 256, 255, because 255 is 1. And how does that look now? I've got the wrong color. Oh, because I took HSV. 175, 181, 169. So close to black. I've completely forgotten those numbers again. And there's no way to copy those ones from here. You can only copy this useless one. 175, 81, 69. 75, 81, 
169, 1, 1, 1. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. It's. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's. <laughs> that's not a pretty color up there, is it? I like that color. That, whatever that was sucks. I like the really nice color over here. Five sixteen eight. Five sixteen eight. Five sixteen eight. Two oh eight. Two sixteen. Two oh five. All right, that's slightly less than awful, but we'll have to worry about that another time. What I'd like to do is actually get some graphics for these other guys. It's like, well, what do we have for these other graphics? Do we really want this? And now what I'm thinking is that, you know, we should actually draw in two phases because these other graphics have to have a different sprite sheet. So we're going to split off the background and draw twice with it. So go back to the renderer. And now we're going to do something really kind of awful. We're going to, we're going to abuse GL here a bit more. Clear vertex. Do this first. Clear vertex. And then we have another thing down here. Fine, render vertex, let's just call it that. Render vertex. And we're gonna break the render up into two bits now. Render background. Definition render foreground, for lack of a better word. And both of these start with the clear vertex and then render vertex. The reason this is completely inefficient is because I'm clearing out all the vertex attributes for each draw, even though most of them are going to be the same. But I'm going to leave that up to some future optimization where we actually care about those things. Again, we're, our GPU on a desktop has so much power that we don't have to carry about this at all right now. We can even recalculate this. So it's actually the same program. We don't even have to use the same program twice, but we do have to do this pushing twice. And this is where we're probably what we're going to do is you would actually have two different programs because it's actually quicker to rebind the program than it is to rebind all of the vertexes each time. And But we're not. I'm just not going to worry about it right now. Render foreground also starts with the clear vertex. Okay, now this should see drawing state. Oh, we're gonna call pass a state to all of them. That would make sense. And we'll have to pass the partial time as well. That makes perfect sense. Why oh, should I copy the whole thing? And if you have any questions, even you, Daza, just let me know. There's a lot of stuff going on here. State 445. Where's 445? Curious. So we set the uniform there. Well, let's actually move some of this out then. Let's move some of this to that basic rendering so we don't actually have to pass this down. We're going to set the program there and use it. And we can actually set the uniforms there as well. Right. 
right, so we, we've accomplished nothing as far as you can tell. But what we have done is we've set it up so that we could, in theory, use two different graphics for the things. So let's create a second graphic now. Where we have the background, we're going to call it background text, first of all. And let's figure that all out, first of all. Wait, wait I screwed something out, background. We're going to create a foreground text as well. And this is more of a, this is going to be our sprite map. We're going to just call it foreground text to our, yeah. And foreground, this becomes text, text. And as you're going to load that thing we saw from before, from file, let's do eggplant.png, <laughs> what we had before. Background, 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 background. So what we have here now is we have a buffer, and I want this render to take the, uh, I'm going to call it sprite map, sprite text here. And this is a glue in. And this is a sprite texture. Which one are we using? And the background is going to use that one, that buffer. And the foreground is going to use the foreground buffer. And that means our graphics come from two different places now. Should I call it text? Because I just changed the name to text. So, whatever this other thing is using is not very interesting. <laughs> um, it is an eggplant. You can see these other small things. They're upside down eggplants. It's very hard to see. But they have transparency on them, so we should be fine with that. Now our goal is to create some sort of sprite map for this stuff. So we see how this actually happens. And our texture here is upside down. We'll get to that as well. So I'm eating the little tiny eggplants. And this is a cartoon character eggplant. But all you have to know is that basically we're doing something now. All right. What this allows us to do is because we have two different graphics is we're going to create a sprite map. And the sprite map means we can take different graphics for each of these things. And we're going to create a basic sprite map. And we're going to do this by going again back to wherever Pixabay is. And let's just look for fruit. And we'll do vector graphics. Now these guys look fun, right? But they look great at this detail level. I'm going to take this thing here because these look great at a smaller detail level and that's really important to me. Let's grab this again. Thank you very much to GDJ for the graphics. All right, where am I? I have a readme file here somewhere. Throw the resources in there and we're going to save these somewhere temporarily. I'm going to save the vector graphic first of all. Yes, wherever, that's fine. Now, let's go over to Inkscape and create a new file. Create a new file. And this is where it's going to get interesting. Because I haven't done this in a long time. Document properties, what size should this be? It's really completely irrelevant because we're gonna work at a different scale. Let's just say 100 by 100. That sounds good, yeah, 100 by 100. Let's zoom in here a bit. I wanna save this first, save a copy. Not save a copy, I want save as. Nah. SDL Remy's. And I'm not going to put this in assets. I'm going to put this in the, for lack of a better term, the design folder. These are like graphics that aren't really foreground sprites. We're going to export to the other folder. Now, I haven't done grids in a long time. How do we set up the grids here? A sprite map is just a grid of a whole bunch of little bits. Now, I'm using a grid. If you're doing a compact sprite map, you, you'd actually 
a real game that's using like 2D graphics and pixel animation, you wouldn't necessarily use a, a fixed grid. You might actually use a program that packs your sprites in as tight as possible and then generates out the data file. But that's a lot more work, so we're not gonna do it for now. What we wanna do is we wanna create a grid. We want a rectangular grid, yes we do. And visible snap, what unit do we want? Well, we created the page in centimeters. So we're gonna create one. And this is probably, this gives us space for like 100 sprites. Which is way more than we need. But if we go to five, we only have four sprites. So we have to do somewhere in between. Let's just do two for now. All right, and the actual size doesn't matter. This gives us space for 25 sprites. That should be enough for us to do stuff with. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take import, some, import that original graphic we had, the one we downloaded, the fruits. All these wonderful fruits. We're gonna scale this down. Zoom back in. Ungroup this thing. I said ungroup. Oh man, it's so hard to ungroup stuff. There, now I have a pear. Let's put the pear over here. I have the strawberry. You can go over here. Cherries, grapes, apple. What else do we have in there? We have. We have a different plum, let's take his different color. We have some plums, sorry that's a pear, why am I calling it a plum? And we have a peach. Anything else, because we have yellow cherries, why not? Let's take some yellow cherries. And we have some green grapes, why not? What else do we have? Any other thing here I'm missing? I guess I can't see the chat now. Okay, nobody said anything. So let's take double peaches. We have those. And a red apple. We have a red apple. So while I'm doing this, let me stick this to both screens. Thank you. I'm gonna just... How can I get this to... There it is. All desktops. There we go. Thanks. Now, red apple. Thank you, red apple. <laughs> uh, anything else we're missing? Um, green grapes, red grapes, apple, green apple, little peach bums, one big peach bum, yellow red. I think that covers everything we have here. So let's get rid of this because this is slowing it down. Because as much as I like Inkscape, Inkscape is damn slow when it deals with vectors, which is really unfortunate. Really nice program, otherwise. And we're going to go in and we're going to make these things bigger. Now, I don't want to make them... You want to make them basically... And the way I'm doing this is not really ideal, right? There's many, many things wrong with doing a sprite map this way. And we'll get to those at some point. And I'm just going to fill them in and we'll understand because when you do the final sprite map, you need to actually have pixel accuracy. And it has to do with the spaces in between them. And we're just going to assume all our sprites are square. Which you see in the game might actually create problems for us, but I don't care. We're just demonstrating some basic concepts here. Now the reason why they should actually have at least one pixel spacing between them is because you want to prevent GL bleeding. Because when you do this GL bleeding, when you do the GL stuff and you want to take part of the sprites, if it gets near the edge, it's going to blend it with the color from the thing nearby. So they should all have spacing in them. But we might get away with this just fine. You can also deal with it the way you arrange these things. You can make them the full size and just arrange them so all the ones with a little bits of space are not fit together. Or, as you know, if you were doing like a serious game, you would just use a program that does this for you. 
But it's good to do these things by hand, first of all, to see how this works. And I've actually done games this way. I did the uh, my Radio Blitz game for iOS. I actually created them by hand, but I was creating them in GIMP with with correct pixel mapping. And they were also continuous textures, so it didn't matter that the edges bled. And that's actually something, and if you'll see in actual 3D games, your, your sprite maps, your texture maps, will actually have bleed area. The, the color for the texture will be slightly bigger than what's actually required. I mean, it's fairly optimized. By slightly bigger, I mean it's probably like one pixel more than it needs to be. All right, so we have this. Now, we need one other texture here because we have the worm. And the worm, this is where it's gonna get weird. We can either just make a pure white or let's get some type of, uh, what type of textures do we have? Texture. This type of cracked worm texture would be cool. Do we have like a reptile texture? Not that worms are reptiles, but worms don't have a fun texture. We could have a snake. That's fine, the snake looks good too. This looks like a delightful one to use. It's going to cause us no end of headaches, but we're going to use it anyways. Thank you to Josh13 for this image. I'm going to take the smallest version we could possibly find of this. <laughs> Paste it down here. And we're going to stick this worm texture. And it's snapping to my grids like an idiot. Fine. We're going to stick it way down here. Okay. Ideally, this texture would be tileable for the worm. So a tile across the worm. <clears throat> we can fix this up later. We can make this tileable. But with this type of texture, to get it correct is really quite difficult to do correctly. And we don't want this to turn into a graphic art show. So we're just going to leave it like that and deal with the hard borders we're going to get in that worm or wherever it is. This is just something, and maybe we should at least make it brighter, but that should be enough for now. The worm will look kind of ugly, but you know, he's not a graphic masterpiece to begin with. So we have all of this. Now we're going to have to hide you for just a second. And we're going to export this page. Take the whole page. And we want some reasonable size here that we can deal with. And more importantly, we want a power of two. And this is where I honestly got to see, I think I screwed up. That it would have been better <laughs> to have four across and four down. Did we already have more than that though? And actually we don't, because then it has nice powers of two. But we're just gonna let GL deal with it, okay? We have no pixel action screen in here, but we're gonna make this whole thing a nice, big rich texture at 1024 and we're going to export this thing this massive texture worms into assets foreground sprites dot png we need the transparency here I think yeah we need the transparency export foreground sprites so you guys can come back. So what will happen now if I do this? If I go and I learn foreground sprites, where's that tree, no, that eggplant. Wormy slash assets, foreground sprites. That entire graphic is gonna be used for every box we draw on the screen, which is gonna look entirely weird. And you can actually see, if you look carefully here, we have pause button. You can see it being used there, the whole thing. So let's move it around. Whoops, no, whatever, to hell with it. You'll see it's upside down, but you can see all the little tiny bits. Make this as big as possible. All the little tiny bits that make up that graphic. We just have to select a part of that now. Now, my worm, something's gone totally, totally wrong with the worm. It's done something really screwed up, but let's just forget about that for now. 
Oh, I think it's because it's. Pa no, I understand what's happening. Yeah, it's about the normalized coordinates. But let's let's get these two little things down here to use a fruit first. And let's make that work with this push push dot. We're going to make the dot take a a reference into the sprite map. Now you probably want to have an index or something for this first, but we're just going to take a hard reference. And the eat me dot, which one should we make it be? Eat me dot, let's start with the big red apple. And this is in position, we're going to say our map is 5 by 5, which is totally fine, 5 by 5. And he's in position, so this is 0, 1, 2. So 1, 2 is where the red apple is. And they chased me one, well, let's chase cherries across the screen. Cherries are fun to chase. And let's chase not the red cherries, let's chase the yellow cherries. And the yellow cherries are 3, 1. So let's go back and do that. So push dot is going to chase 1, 2, 3, 1. This use of constants in a program if you were on my project, I'd probably slap you for putting this in here, but <laughs> we have a lot of stuff missing from Leaf right now, and I just want to get this stuff working, and we'll, we'll refactor this and clean this up. And this is the sprite, push dot, and where is push dot? Push dot. And push dot now has a sprite. Uh-oh. My computer's making funny noises. A sprite, which is an integer, comma, integer. Uh-oh, my fan's going crazy. Bad, bad. Hopefully it doesn't get too loud, and hopefully... I'll have to fix it after. It's not turning too fast, so okay, we're cold. Oh, whatever, sound went away. So that's a sprite. In the box, we're going to push the box should also have a sprite. Well, this is going to be lots of fun. So push box has a sprite as well. And you can type aliases as well, but I'm uncertain about this being a correct type alias still. The push rec also has a sprite. Sprite. And copy that sprite. Okay, now what changes is this text coordinates. This is based off of the sprite now. So our sprite box is sx equals sprite dot x, and we're going to convert this to a float first of all. Float a gl float because that's what it loves. It loves gl floats. GL floats, and we're just going to magically know that it's 5 by 5. <laughs> Geo sprite x divided by 5. And sprite y equals lossy GL floats. Well, let's do it this way. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it anyway. Sprite y, and we'll do by sprite scale. I'll be at least somewhat scared. Sprite scale. Right scale, and this has to be a GL float, equals 1 divided by 5. Now, this actually works in Leaf. I know it doesn't work in a lot of languages. It's going to use 0. But this is one of the things I wanted to fix in the language, is that this remains as a rational until it's assigned somewhere, and then it knows that 1, 5 can become a float. So this will actually work. So we're going to push SX, SY. And I'm going to tell you right away why this is a big problem. SX plus right scale. SX plus right scale. SX and SY. SY, SY plus right scale. The reason why this won't work is that. The matrix is the other way around. But let's see what we get out of this first. The tuple does not contain the symbol x. Well, that's not surprising. This is supposed to be...
what have I done wrong here? 419, 419. Push wrecked and forgot to write. Oh, hmm. <laughs> Perhaps push wreck should not take a sprite. I'm going to use it here again as well. Who all calls push red? How else can we do this then? We could push a. Well, let's just do this. Let's be stupid. Let's put this GL float. Let's do sprite scale. It's an integer as well. Sprite scale F equals one divided by sprite scale. Now we have to force the conversion though because now it will do integer division. Well, I'll see. GL float. Sprite scale F, sprite scale F. And this may sound really silly, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to say push rect. It wants sprite 0, 0 for the background. It has a sprite scale of 1. That takes the whole thing. It treats it as a single sprite. Push rect here, and this sprite scale is 5. And this is really, really messy what I'm doing, but we're just going to deal with it this way for now. And look! We have an apple and cherries, and I forgot we can't go around. So now we have an apple and cherries, that's great. Are these, what I can't tell, because I'm moving it so small, is whether they're anti-alias correctly. This is a historically annoying thing to do. Now we had to take care of the worm as well. And these should be, you know, the other way around, of course. Because we actually have the right items, we just have to flip the text coordinates. And we can do that by just doing it this way. We push. Yeah, we just do the other way around. We just flip it, and that'll give them the right way. Now we're going to do the push body segments. It also has to do this. Okay, and it has the scaling here. And this is the biggest issue here is that this thing has to be in the bottom right. And we should create a function for normalizing a position, but I really just want to see it work right now. So I'm going to calculate in my head 5 by 5. This is 80, so this is 0.9 by 0.9. And that's the middle of it, 0.9 by 0.9. And rel L is going to be. 0 0.9 plus that, 0 0.9 plus the part around the square. So we just get consistency in there. And that should be fine. So our apple and cherry are the right way up. And the worm is really wacky. What have I done wrong there? Oh, I know what I've probably done wrong. So maybe we have stealth mode worm. What I've done wrong there is this rel x is too big. This should only be times 0 0.2 times 0. Point, actually 0 0.1 because it's twice the size and that should cover that sprite area. There. Now the snake has a somewhat the worm has a somewhat snaky texture to it. 
So now we've added basic graphics, basic sprite graphics to our game. I think the background is actually entirely too, is the background too dark for this? It's not enough contrast, I think. So how can we lose, we can change the contrast of the background quickly? Well, we can just change the graphic. That's, to be honest, probably the quickest way. Or, or, and this is fun with GL, and the reason why I think all graphics should be done in floats and not integers is we can simply make it brighter, the background. Because we're multiplying by a value. We're multiplying by a value there. I know it doesn't really look at it. We're not really seeing the colors that I'm doing on the screen. Right, these colors of the state eat me and chase me are not really being applied very well. So let's look at the background again. Background, where is this being pushed? Render background. So the background is a color one. We can actually make this like really super bright, the background. By just, this is getting a little bit ridiculous though, but we can, We don't have an easy way to reduce the contrast of it though. But let's just get rid of it a little bit, make it a little bit lower. Just make it a little bit brighter as a quick test. But what I meant about the multiplication there is that I didn't take care of the other things is that our worm is still green even though the texture is silver. And that's good because it means we multiply the value of it. We make them red, that's good. But these other things here, we don't actually want to change the color of them. We want to use the exact color. So we have that red. You notice it's actually changed it. And we have that yellow. And it's actually a different yellow. I think we just got lucky on the colors we chose that they are actually very close to the colors we used originally. But we're actually going to let it use, let's use the sprite color entirely. And that means to use 1, 1, 1, 1. There, and now they actually look much nicer. And the aliasing is clearer, and we have this little, I'm not so happy about the cherry, it's pretty small. Come on back here, cherry. But he's hard to get, that's fine. The cherry chasing is hard. Although maybe it should be the static one like that. Maybe it should be reversed, right? Because the one that's moving should be the one that's easier to see. And so we can reverse these three comma one and one comma two. And so the one that's not moving is a little bit easier to see, but we have to clean up the graphics so the apple moving is easier. And the cherry is still, it's really quite small. <clears throat> and I think it's getting lost in the background graphics. which means we should probably reduce the contrast in the background graphics because they're kind of distracting. So let's go and kill those off a bit. We have that here somewhere. Where's GIMP? Come on, GIMP. Once, zoom that out. And I'm just going to kill this contrast here. Color, brightness, contrast. Let's kill the contrast a bit. Everything we kill the contrast, we're going to put the brightness back. Now one feature I've always wanted in these tools is, I don't know how to do it, is that I want the contrast to be set to a fixed level across the board so it would adjust the contrast here and not the rest of it. And this has gotten way too dark. This looks better. So you don't want to do this. You don't want to, you don't want to fix the back thing here and say, look, that's really dark. And we're actually going to extend the gray a bit. That should be good enough. And I want to give it a bit of color. If we give it a bit of brown instead. Gardeny green. Let's give it a gardeny green. Should be enough. And overwrite. So now when we start the game, 
the background has less contrast. And that's what we want. It's easier to see the yellow one. And the, the red one shows up. That's fine as well. So now we have the graphics of the game. We put the graphics up in the corner. The title's up there. The cherries are down here. And we did this using a sprite map. So this second call, the draw, to draw to the foreground is still just one draw call, which draws all the front items here, including the snake or the worm. Probably even have a snake at one point. And we made the boards of the screen kill you, which makes the game a bit more challenging now, and I have to move the whole time to get it done. The scores at the top, it probably should be in the top right, but we have an alignment problem with my code. We had to create generic alignments. Oops, and now I died. Wonderful. I want to start again. I'm going to end the show on that. Let's quickly give an idea. So this apple and stuff, this the shaking is kind of annoying. It comes from this sprite map here. And we have all these other sprites we could use too, and we can add them in other shows in the next show to figure out what happens. We should add some sort of borders to the screen too, like little blocks where you cannot move. And that would make it more interesting just in the middle of the screen, just put blocks you can't go through. We put a background in, we moved this up, the text, we loaded this, we modified the shaders to deal with this. Um, let's check the shaders that were doing the right thing, that were back to the right place we expected. I think I'm I think I'm getting rid of the colors, and we want to put those back, I think. No, we actually have it there. We have all the intelligence of the other colors. So we're actually highlighting these things still. We're colorizing them. And we have the light direction, that's fine. Light intensity, that's totally fine. We have everything correct there. And so this is our game so far. I'm going to close it again. I'm going to zoom it in one more time, and then we'll play it. And then we'll end the episode of it with it. There we go. So we created the spite map. <clears throat> we used the three sprites. We could use more. We added a background. You know, I can't go through the edges. It makes it quite a bit harder to get these moving ones. Moving ones are worth more. Now, I'd like to say we have some semblance of a game. I mean, obviously we have more technology here than like some of the original way long time ago games that were actually pixelated. We're using, we're not using vector graphics, but we're using like high, high resolution textures. And I think, I still think the Apple has the dumb, dumb weird easing we added to it. And you notice the snake still has the shading, it still has that highlighting based on the lights. Still animated around, our score updates. We have a more pleasant background, which should make for some more pleasant screenshots. You know, super pleasant now. And next time, I say next time in the show, why don't we add, and I think I can do this tomorrow. I'll see what I'm doing tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon again, if I have time. We'll add little bushes and stuff that come out. And we might have to start worrying about layout at the top. But I'm slowly getting ahead of what I can do with Leaf, actually. There's some stuff that we want to do with like doing the UI that until I actually have interfaces supported, like interface or traits, as Russ would call them, something like that, it's really hard to do the UI because the UI is a very object-oriented centric system, and there's no real way to do object orientation in Leaf yet. So that's something I'm going to have to add, along with all these little things I have to fix, I have to catch up on, I'm falling behind with it. So I'm trying to think of how much further we can go. Um, well, we can add stuff like gamepad support and stuff first without doing too much. We can add the random things in the screen. We can improve the randomness. So I think there's enough that I can actually look at doing this. Keep going, even though Leaf is a bit further behind. I'm going to have more time to do these shows in the future, I guess. Can I get the apple? Oh, I missed the apple. Come on, get the apple. Yeah, good. I'll have more time. And we'll keep doing it that. So I think we're done the show. I can probably play a bit longer here. Um, as soon as I say that, I usually end up dying. But we're going to make a hard mode. If I put bushes and stuff, it gets harder. Tonight, a little bit later. Um, oh, no. I think I just killed myself. Oh, no. no oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is bad. No. Okay. I just killed myself. All right. Later tonight, I will go back to the coding game concert. Con 
test competition. I noticed I made it up to Silver League by doing nothing. What I'm going to aim for is let's try to go for gold. We're not going to go for legendary. If we get gold tonight or tomorrow, we're just done. We're just stop at gold. I'm going to set my goal, and we'll see how much it takes to get to gold then. And I'll do that later tonight, maybe around 9 or 10. Um, if I can get on over there, just follow me on Twitter and follow me on Twitch as I always announce the things an hour to a couple hours ahead of time or half an hour depending on when what time I have. But I'll let you know and then I hope you enjoyed the show and I hope you're learning a little bit about how some graphics and stuff are done. Very rudimentary and obviously you'd have a much more advanced system behind a full game but we're just going to keep adding it. We're going to keep refactoring and adding this stuff and see what happens. Um, I thank you very much for watching and we'll see you later tonight if you want otherwise tomorrow.